Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the third session of today's event, Women in Conflict Resolution Transformation Case Studies. It's been an intense evening here in Europe, and I hope this session will add lots of good reflections to the program. I'm Marcia de Abreu, and it's my honor to serve as the moderator in this session in which several distinguished speakers will be offering their thoughts. It was not too long ago in October 2000 when women's participation at peace negotiation tables was recognized as essential. Dr. Sel Ben Gurirab, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Namibia, and president of the Security Council at the time the UN approved Resolution 1325, which was so much talked about today and brought women as necessary actors into the peace processes, expressed, if women are half of the whole community, shouldn't they also be half of all the solution? Since then, and little by little, women have been stepping into the area of conflict prevention and, their, and resolution, but it wasn't easy to get to this point. Women's powerful actions for peace in national and international organizations was not easily transferred to the negotiation tables. They didn't have, they didn't have enough political power. They had been fighting previously peacefully against the horrors of wars through demonstrations, walks, declarations, statements, civil disobedience, peace camps, etc., in order to avoid resolving a conflict by the means of weapons. The 20th and 21st centuries have plenty of examples of women contributing to peace by promoting or applying a new paradigm, a new style of doing things that involves concern and care for the other. What Latin American women called, and Adriana Quinones must know this very well, maternage. It refers to respect for human life as the basis for any type of action. It refers to love for the preservation of life that both men and women can exercise. So women's positive participation in these processes is what we are going to talk about in this session. So with no further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Her Excellency Emilia Redzepi, is Deputy Prime Minister for Minority Issues and Human Rights in Kosovo. She is also the Director of the Directorate for Culture, Youth and Sports, and has been an active member of the dialogue and normalization of relations between Serbia and Kosovo. Promoted by the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSI. Mrs. Rezepi, we are very happy, very pleased to be able to welcome you today. I know you had some difficulties with internet, but now you are here with us and you have the floor. Please unmute. It's okay? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I have too much problem with connection in our government. Uh, our system is not, uh, uh, it's not good. And I travel one hour to come connected here in another town. And uh, thank you very much for uh, your invitation in this big conference uh, for me. But uh, I will continue in Bosnian or Serbian language, but I took my interpreter with me and she will help me. It's okay for you? Yes, certainly. Okay, great. Mnoge svetske krize, političke, ratne, ekonomske, socijalne, 
su rešavale uglavnom samo muškarci. Many of the world's crises, be it political, war, economic or social, were mainly solved by men alone. Istorija piše da takve krize gde su učestvovali žene imale su fleksibilnije rezultate. Nažalost, bilo je malo gučešća žena u svim tim krizama. Žena je uvek manje zastupljena u društveno-političkom životu u svim zemljama. Excuse me, excuse me, Ms. Redzepi. Could the interpreter come a little closer to you because we are hearing very far? Just a moment. Yes. Žena je uvek manje zastupljena u društveno-političkom životu. Žena često puta sporije i sigurnije donosi odluke. Što zbog potisnutosti od strane muškaraca? Što zbog potrebe da osigura i sebe i okolinu? I mnogi drugi razloci. U istoriji se na prstima ruku mogu izbrojati žene koje su imale državnu moć i vlast. I uglavnom su njihove biografije pozitivne i istorijski duboko upečatljive. To znači da moramo se boriti i izboriti za rodnu ravnopravnost. Praksa kaže da je to moguće samo kroz donošenje zakona i striktno poštovanje zakona. A po nadzorom evropskih i svetskih organizacija da bude svaka takva država. Bez stalnog monitoringa u mnogim državama je ostvarenje ovih prava nemoguća misija, jer jači pol uvek teži da dominira u društvu. Republika Kosovo je mlada država, ali je bila primer patriarchalnog državnog uređenja. Od 1988. godine, kada je broj žena koje nisu bile obrazovane bio 75%, dolazimo do momenta kada Kosovo kao država ima predsednicu države na čelu. Ja sam zamenica premijera Kosova za ljudska prava i nevećinske narode. Imamo veliki broj žena ministrica. Poslanice u parlamentu. Vođe nevladinog i vladinog sektora. Naravno da trebamo još tu da radimo. Mi ćemo nastojati da žene na Kosovu imaju veća prava uz konstruktivni trud da uključenost žena u institucije bude mnogobrojna i nećemo stati sve dok ne postignemo jednakost oba pola. 
We will strive for women in Kosovo to have greater rights with a constant effort to increase the number of women involved in institutions, and we will not stop until we achieve equality for both genders. To u svakom slučaju neće biti jednostavan cilj, ali smo nošeni optimizmom vidljivih rezultata koje imamo i za sob i za nas. In any case, it will not be simple though, but we are carried by the optimism of the visible results behind us. Taj prosperitet dugujemo i međunarodnoj zajednici. We owe this prosperity to the international community as well, koja je okrenuta pravima žena which is focused on the rights of women, pravima nevećinskih zajednica i vrši konstantan pritisak na kosovske vlasti kako bi se napravio okvir u kome će svi građani, bez obzira na pol ili etničku pripadnost, biti jednako važni kao građani naše države Republike Kosovo. And exerts constant pressure on the Kosovo authorities in order to create a framework in which all citizens, regardless of gender or ethnicity, will be equally important as citizens of our Republic of Kosovo. Naš prosperitet i progres vidimo samo preko edukacije, odnosno obrazovanja. We only see our prosperity and progress through education. Posebno mladih devojaka u ruralnim mestima. Especially of young girls in rural areas. Naša vlada daje akcenat na socijalnu politiku, odnosno finansijsku pomoć deci i samohranim majkama, ali naravno da je to nedovoljno za njihovu egzistenciju. Kao društvo u celini još moramo raditi na sebi, i razbijati stereotipe da žena je manje vrednija u društvu od muškaraca. Kosovo je multietnička država sa većinskim albanskim narodom, ali ovde žive i Srbi, Bošnjaci, Turci, Romi, Aškalije, Egipćani i ostali. Kosovo je multietnička država sa većinskim albanskim narodom, Svi se moramo uvažavati i poštovati jedne druge i graditi normalnu budućnost i život svih nas. Zahvaljujem se još jednom. Thank you, Mrs. Redsit. Thank you for your presentation. You have referred, you shared with us the developments that have been occurring uh, in Kosovo in relation to women's uh, progress in uh, equity. We are very thankful actually to Kosovo women for working hard to obtain basic freedom for establishing pro-gender equity and becoming participants in peace building processes in the Kosovo's rehabilitation course going on. Um, you are also referred to the progress happening in the area of education, so essential. And that was talked about by Dr. Yakubi in the first session. Uh, I would like to uh, refer to one point that is still, let's say, a black point that needs to be helped. And that is uh, what is happening in the rural areas. Because of traditional practices, women are left with a very difficult future after the loss of their husbands or fathers. Would you have any good example of initiatives being taken in order to open up the way for women in those areas. Znate sami da je Kosovo izašlo iz rata kao država i da ima mnogih negativnih i traumatskih uticaja u društvu na celini u celini. You know that Kosovo has come out from a war and has had many many traumatskih traumatic uh, states on društvo in, in society. 
Takođe imamo veliki broj naših žena koje žive po selima. Obično su to neobrazovane žene. Ne rade nigde. Bave se edukacijom i vaspitanjem svoje dece. Dok im muževi rade ili na Kosovu ili vani i građevinske radove. I onda kada oni ostanu bez supruga, ostaju bez svoje životne egzistencije. To je veliki problem u društvu. Pokušavamo da sa našom socijalnom politikom ove vlade pomognemo toj kategoriji. Obezbeđujemo mesečnu finansijsku podršku i deci i samohrani majkama. Pokušavamo da ih preko raznih organizacija, preko nevodinih organizacija uključimo u mnoge aktivnosti. I dosta se žena javlja da rade. Imamo jedan pozitivan primer u maloj kruši, velikoj kruši ovde u blizinu Prizrena. To je jedno selo u kojem su stradale tokom rata veliki stotinak broja muškaraca. I jako su dobro te žene uključene u sistem preko projekata koje se bave raznim poljoprivrednim delatnostima. One su već u sistem, rade, i godinama imaju svoju platu. Za njihovu decu osigurali smo besplatno školovanje. I mnoge olakšice za njihov život. Naravno da ne možemo sve da pokrijemo. Naravno da nismo jaka ekonomska država. Ali dajemo maksimum da najugroženijoj kategoriji društva pomogne. Imamo i program socijalne pomoći gde mesečno dajemo i hranu i higijanske preparate svim porodicama. Ok, thank you very much. Thank you for what you are doing. I'm sure Kosovo society as a new nation, young nation, needs lots to be done. And uh, I'm sure you are working hard together with your colleagues and friends in the country. So thank you very much. Excellent presentation. We'll be back to you much later after all the presentations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be part of this conference. We are glad to have you. <laughs> okay. So I'll pass on to the next speaker will be uh, her Excellency Natasa Michik. Mrs. Michik is a lawyer and politician. She was the president of the Civic Alliance of Serbia, later the vice president and president of the political council of the Liberal Democratic Party. Mrs. Michik was also member of the Serbian parliament as an opposition uh, parliamentarian from 2004 to 2019. In 2001, she became the president of the National Assembly in Serbia and the chairperson of its constitutional committee. At only the age of 37, 
and from 2002 to 2004, she was the acting president of Serbia. Today, she is a member of the regional women's lobby in Southeast Europe and a member of the Podgorica Club, which brings together former presidents of the states and governments of the Western Balkans. Uh, I must say that Mrs. Michik excused herself for being unable to join us live, but she wanted to participate in the event and prepared a video presentation. Let's watch her video. Dear conference participants and organizers, I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate in the work of the conference in this way. The serious international security crisis caused by Russian aggression, to which we do not see an end for now, will not end without the contribution of women, because there is no achievement and sustainability of peace without the participation of women. This is a constant foreseen by UN resolution 1325, which was also ratified by Serbia and then adopted in its national action plan. However, this was not enough for women to participate in formal negotiations. Tensions in the region and the frozen conflict between Serbia and Kosovo can last for more than a quarter of a century. Let me remind you, during the wars of the 1990s, women did not participate in armed conflicts but were the main barrier of anti-war policy through the non-governmental sector and a party such as the GSS, whose leader was a woman. After the armed conflicts, we insisted that the crimes should not be hidden, then the perpetrators should be called by their real name and punished, because that was the only way to reconciliation. Even all that was not enough to get them to the negotiation table. By the way, the first initiatives after the wars, which armed at mutual understanding, opening dialogue and achieving peace, were initiated by women. I would like to mention the rule of the regional women's lobby, which did not shy away from opening the issue of responsibility and confronting the past. In contrast to formal negotiations in which these issues were avoided. At the meetings and conferences of the regional women's lobby, we had the opportunity to find out, because it was not in the media, about numerous examples of their courage, from saving the lives of people of other nationalities during the war, to establishing mutual connections in order to obtain, for example, necessary medicine and documentations. We were also able to meet those incredible women, women who, despite personal war tragedies, offered the hand of reconciliation, such as the late Kosovo Minister of Justice, who, despite the fact that the Serbs took her two sons and husband from the apartment and who never returned, found a straight to advocate for reconciliation and fight for a life without national conflicts. Although the world in general has been changing rapidly, the processes of strengthening the rule, role of women especially in conflict and post-conflict societies, are being realized slowly. It remains for us to persevere even more against 
marginalization to, to, to show stronger solidarity against injustice and to be even more determined in the fight for equality. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mrs. Michik, for your words. You reminded us of the work that women in Serbia did so uh, courageously. In fact, I can see the strength of uh, uh, women in Serbia in you somehow. Uh, who were very courageous in 1991, women who stood up to their politicians at the parliament and proposed the formation of delegations with experts in all fields from the government, from the opposition and from the civil society in order to find negotiated solutions to the crisis. Uh, they also try to negotiate how to, on how to live together and uh, how to separate, if not, if it was not possible to live to together, how to separate peacefully, at least. So uh, Serbian women fought hard for peace uh, before and during the war. And uh, this example you give, you gave for uh, women in Serbia reconciling with uh, women in Kosovo is very crucial, very important. Thank you again. We'll keep moving on. We have another speaker, Honorable Emanuela del Re, an Italian politician and sociologist expert in international politics, specialist in migration and refugees, conflicts, conflicts religious issues and minorities. Mrs. Del Re served as Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs in Italy and has been the European Union representative, special representative for the Sahel since 2018, actually, sorry, 2021. The Sahel is a region in the north of Africa that includes around 10 countries. So um, just today, we got the message that she had to go into hospital uh, for a surgery. And uh, we are very sorry that she cannot be live with us as well, but she made her efforts to send us a message. And I would like to invite uh, Mrs. Elisabetta Nistri, the president of the Women's Federation in Italy to read her message. Please, Elisabetta. Yes. Good evening, everybody. On behalf of Honorable Manuel Torre, I am going to read her speech. Dear friends, I do really apologize for not being with you this afternoon. Unfortunately, I had gone under surgery for my meniscus and I'm not able to join this interesting event and discussion. I'm sending you this brief message to express my gratitude to the organizer for the kind invitation. The topic that you are discussing today is very close to me for my personal story and my background. I have been working in conflict resolution and conflict prevention for all my life, for almost 35 years. I have extensively written on the UNSC Resolution 3025 and, in particular, on the significance of UN Resolution 3025 for the Syrian woman in years of conflict. Since the UNSC, UNSC 3025, the United Nations Security Council has developed is focused to nine additional resolutions, culminating in the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Though recognized internationally, challenges remain. Women's participation in conflict prevention and peacekeeping is still lack. More action can be taken to utilize the strengths of women and enhance the overall approach to peacekeeping operations. 
women need to play a more central role in the design and implementation of post conflict resolution and peace building activities. We can take into action account the recommendation defined during the second edition of Women in Conflict, the event that took place in Brussels on Thursday, 9 June 2022, co-hosted by the European Council President Charles Michel, together with UN Women, Nadia's Initiative, and the Dr. Denise Mukwaj Foundation. We need clear action to support the full, equal, and meaningful participation of women and girls in areas such as conflict prevention, crisis management, and long-term decision. The European Union will continue supporting the states in conflict and post-conflict situation. The tile, the reason that uh, I represent political level for the European Union being the US Special Representative for the Sahel since July 2021 has seen an increase in armed conflict in recent years with the effect, especially on the most vulnerable communities, in particular on youth and women. More actions are required and we are working with our local and regional partners to include Sahelian women in conflict prevention and resolution, mediation, post-conflict negotiation, and post-conflict re reconstruction, and the gender inclusion in security sector reform. Integrating gender into peace programming and the processes is also an important aspect to consider. In addition to the adoption and the implementation of policies, laws and measures for the empowerment of gender equality in accordance with existing international and regional legal instruments. Women can make the difference. There is so much to do, but we can be real actors of change. Thank you very much on behalf of Honorable Terveo. Thank you, Elisabetta. Thank you for reading such a uh, complete and important message from uh, Honorable Del Rey. Uh, it's a real pity that she's, she cannot be with us today as I wanted so much to ask her about uh, real situations now in this part of Africa, in the North of Africa. So what is she doing in what she is involved right now? We know uh, during the history, there are many cases, but I would like to know right now what's happening. And it's a pity she cannot be with us. But anyhow, we thank her very much for her contribution. So uh, our next presenter, it's a joy to present uh, her as our last speaker. At a very young age of 22, she is already developing a magnificent career that has to do with peace and development processes. She is currently serving in the Bureau of the NGO CSW Geneva Committee as its secretary, facilitating human rights and policymaking advocacy at the UN. She is the co-founder and the director of Policy Think International organization that promotes the development of human rights. So uh, let's give Shruti, Shruti Leka, a, well, a warm welcome. And uh, I'm sure she will going to, she's going to share with us about youth. What is youth doing nowadays? Shruti, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, it is really an honor to talk to you all um, in such a very, very, um, very prestigious panel with so many, so many um, successful women from all around the world sharing best, uh, best practices. Thank you so much for inviting me and personally to all my um, 
uh, fellow colleagues and all, everybody who's been encouraging me from the Women's Federation Network. Thank you so much. Um, so I will be talking to you today about a a specific uh, um, project that um, the Women's Federation for World Peace International UN office in Geneva, uh, myself and Mrs. Uh, Carolyn Henshin has been engaging in for the past two years. So we always thought that young people um, have to have leadership. So almost all of us have been talking about it, like young youth leadership and peace building. But how do we actually give them leadership when they have when they have no space for leadership? So although we cannot be, um, although we as a um, a civil society organization are not so powerful like member states to host host and um host host high level political agreements we still took our efforts to organize a peace building commission as the idea of the project so the project idea was to organize a peace building commission to simulate the peace building commission with young people from um, conflict regions so bring uh, young people from conflicting parties and engage and make them engage in a peace building process mediation and negotiation putting them in a situation to debate for a peace agreement but they're not debating in their own shoes they're debating as the representatives of the state so this puts them not just only on the moral values but also in the shoes of how the political needs the self-interest the history the current social context everything in their shoes so that is where we actually try to practice youth leadership so we put them and then the first uh, first one of this initiative was the last year P, uh, Palestine and Israel initiative. So we tried organizing this conference last year for the first time inviting Palestinians and Israelis with international young people as well, simulating them in a peace conference. And believe me, in two days during the whole debate, we actually thought, oh my God, we are never going to be able to convince these young people to make them because that was the furiousness of the debate. That was the intensity of the emotions and the conflict, understanding of the conflict. Young people understood very well about the conflict, about different parties, but putting them in the role, it was very difficult even young people to set aside politics. So they did their job really well, but it was a it was a very law, it was a very huge amount of mediation required. But then at the end of the two days, the both Palestinians, Israelis and the international young people achieved in establishing a peace agreement. So they all agreed and we um, established a peace agreement, which even went into the details of how there should be land recognition, which territory belongs to which country and how are we gonna respect human rights? How are we gonna develop further? How are we gonna work on investment portfolios too? So this was the detail of their work. And with that success, we, we came back again this year and worked on, um, the second edition with the Korean Peace Accord, so the Korean uh, conflict in mind. The, prob the problem to uh, the only struggle we had with this year and the, the main factor even is what I'm trying to, I will be concluding with is that this year we wanted to bring North Koreans and South Koreans. But as you are aware of, it's, it's very, it's impossible to have North Koreans to speak from uh, to speak and access such platforms to speak for peace, to for for negotiation, for mediation, or even participate. So it is very difficult, and it was very difficult to bring North Korean representatives themselves. So we brought other international young people to act like North Korean member state, and they did. But it was wonderful because they, we had a Indian young delegates acting as North Korean states. So they got into the role. They were so furious and they got into the role perfectly. But then so we we really thought, oh, my God, it's not a North Korean. It's an Indian who's who's simulating in this. So there are high chances that the person does not understand the necessity of the peace there because it's far from his or her conflict situation. 
But even in that situation, in two days, the young people made sure that they achieved an agreement. And this in this was not they they this was not rhetoric. They were talking about step by step step the steps they would take from the issue of de-escalating, withdrawing troops, to uh, to reducing the uh, armament and the nuclearization, to the whole process. So this was this shows how empowered and how informed the young people are, and how much ready the young people are to take leadership in peace building. But the fact that but the fact that we often keep missing is that there's not enough space for young people to participate. And there's in so many cases, for example, in the case of North Korea, in this year's edition of the conference, we were not able to access them and they were not able to access the opportunity to talk to South Koreans. And therefore, these such spaces are very important. And that is where I believe civil society brings a big role, plays a big role to bring young people, to engage young people. I'm at the UN attending the Human Rights Council today, and it and we saw a lot of young people present here. We saw so many representations of young people in the council, in the in the as panelists and so on. So there is a high representation, but we still miss a lot of grassroots representation. So we need more young people in the grassroots representations for peace building. And I think that it is the most crucial part of mass mobilization. If you need to mobilize peace mass at a mass level, at a bigger population level, you need to you need to hold the bigger part of the population in the debate. So thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Shruti. Very, very interesting points. I actually, I thought about a question for you, but you kind of answered already. Um, I, I thought defending, and that's, that has been said here in this in these discussions today, defending peace is an option that both men and women can make. And uh, my question would be, what are your main observations of that happening among the youth? Of course, the youth you are dealing with are trained youth, uh, don't you think? They are really trained. So the other option uh, would be through uh, NGOs through the civil society in organizations, associations to involve them. Anywhere else do you think uh, we should try to involve young people and give opportunities for them to learn what it is to build peace? Oh, um, I think I have to mention that it was to our surprise as well that now, almost 80 percentage of the young delegates we had in the conference were all high school students oh, really? so we didn't realize that when we actually talked to them they didn't sound like high school students when they were talking about politics and such a comprehensive understanding of peace building we didn't know that they were they didn't they, they didn't go to courses on international relations or peace building conflict studies they're all high school students just uh, struggling to get their grades and pass out of school. So, but then they still had this great comprehensive understanding. They they knew what their motivation is going to be. That is what I think is the power of young people because they're already in a generation of moving towards peace, harmony, and security. But obviously there exists a lot of spaces. There needs to be more capacity building done. A lot of young people need capacity building to enable spaces where they can come and discuss and engage in debates and engage in processes, be it at national or international or even a little town level. So. I think the capacity building is a big role that the NGOs must fulfill and member states as well, but NGOs do play a big role because they're more trusted by the people, uh, unfortunately, than member states and other um, uh, bigger institutions because NGOs are more relatable to the people. So young people more trust them. Yeah. And, but, but, 
there needs to be a big trust in young people already because they really know what they're doing. They're seeing everything. I mean, my niece is two years old and she already can go through YouTube. <laughs> so she can she can switch channels. And I never did that when I was that age. I never, I started using a mobile phone when I was 20, 18 or something. So you see the whole generation difference that we face that the, the young people are already empowered, but there needs to be more empowerment, but there needs to be also respect for the empowerment they already have so they can yeah, you be a part of the inclusive it. process. Thank you very much, Shruti. Thank you indeed. Uh, we have to prepare our youngsters, our youth, to be prepared to, to be ready to serve society. And uh, I once I read that uh, there was a kind of prayer by a leader that uh, would pray with his children and he would say, let's uh, be ready to share with our society our qualities. Let's serve societies. He would pray with his children there. So I think this, uh, this mentality, this mindset of serving the, the others, society, the world is something that needs to be uh, to come from our families and uh, to our societies and multiply from there. So thank you. The project you are doing is remarkable. It's really great. And uh, I really hope it can develop and you can, you can have successful events with uh, many interesting youth. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, uh, Unfortunately, we have come to the end of this session, and I would love to continue enjoying this opportunity with women who have so much to share, but as also Alexander shared before, we have no time, so maybe on a, in another opportunity. So let's thank our speakers for their excellent contributions to the discussions, and also let's thank our participants who, uh, who kept faithfully uh, listening. I hope it was interesting and enlightening for them. I don't want you to leave yet. Uh, please just remain for a few minutes. Let me introduce Miti Toma, Vice President of the Women's Federation in Europe and President in the UK. Um, she will inform about an initiative of a humanitarian project for Ukraine. The floor is yours, Miti. Thank you very much, Marcia. This has been a really wonderful, wonderful conference, I must say. And all the panelists have touched on so many important issues relating to women, like breaking the glass ceilings and also being patient as well. There is always a time and a place for women to shine and also touching on the human rights issues and women's equality. So it's been a very uh, enriching uh, conference so far. And, as, and I would like to just move on to another point of humanitarian work. Uh, as much as we want to talk about these uh, issues, we do need to go out and help our, our brothers and sisters who are in need, who are going through either conflict or, or in the middle of a conflict situation. So the Women's Federation here in Europe have decided to um, support and initiate a project for uh, the, the, the situation in, in Ukraine. And um, it's, it's in this segment, we will be exploring that and we will be sharing the, the project. And I'll be introducing the, the humanitarian aid project, which is being launched today. And um, it is a project of the Women's Federation Europe and Middle East. Uh, its aim is to, to help the victims of war the project's goals are to provide psychological and humanitarian and also uh, medical aid for families who have suffered from the war in, in Ukraine. Not just, just this war, recent war, but also the war that had happened earlier as well. So it's like a continuation and um, this project will be introduced by one of my colleagues who has been actually based in the Ukraine since the war has happened. And she's been very courageous with a number of our colleagues who stayed in Ukraine and faced many, many challenges. And even at the risk of their life, they stayed in the Ukraine. So I would like to introduce my dear friend and colleague, 
uh, Mrs. Anna Kalmatska, who is the vice president of uh, Women's Federation in Ukraine. And she's uh, been working tirelessly and un unselfishly and actively working for a lot of public projects and especially in the in a charitable, se charitable sector and in the cultural uh, programs that she set up. And she has been recognized by the local governments and also national governments for her awards and have been really um, honored for her work and outreach together with her team in the Ukraine. So let us welcome um, Mrs. Anna, uh, who she will, she will explain a little bit uh, through a PowerPoint uh, as we launch this uh, humanitarian program. Thank you. Over to you, Anna. Yes, thank you, dear Miki. Thank you, everyone, and uh, many greetings from Ukraine. So, yeah. <clears throat> so, first of all, I want to thank Women's Federation for World Peace Europe for its constant support and concern for our situation in Ukraine, and of course, for this opportunity to speak today at such honorable meeting. And I'm here today with our wonderful team of Women's Federation for World Peace Ukraine. Though the majority of our members became refugees or internally displaced persons, we haven't stopped our activity since the outbreak of the war. And our work actually has become even larger as we got hundreds of requests for help from many people who faced the horror and the consequences of war. I'm also honored to introduce today our head of the board, Mrs. Tatiana Kotseba, who has been staying in the capital of Ukraine, the city of Kyiv, since the war started. The mother of five children, winner of more than 50 different awards from state and public organizations, Mrs. Kotseba has been the head of the organization since its foundation in Ukraine in 2007. The project that I will introduce today is aimed at providing psychological, humanitarian, and medical aid to families who suffered from the war and who are staying in rural areas in the Kyiv region. We're going to reach at least 100 people from the needy segments of the population. Uh, more than half of our beneficiaries are displaced from places of hostilities. They moved to small villages where they found simple housing and difficult living conditions. Having faced the horror of war, many of them are traumatized and need psychological support. Very often these are large families, the elderly and people with disabilities, and there are obstacles to their movement to places of assistance. They do not have access to information or to legal or social assistance, and simply they don't have finances. Many times they cannot even apply for status as internally displaced persons. The solution for such people is for help to come to them. All these people are wards of the Ministry of Veteran Affairs, namely of the Kyiv Svetoshin Center for Social and Psychological Rehabilitation in the city of Boyaka. The center has been our long-term partner since 2015. It is a state institution that was originally created to help people affected by the consequences of Chernobyl disaster. And since 2014, it has been reclassified as a center for helping internally displaced persons. It has vast experience in providing various kinds of assistance to people in need. The director of the center is an honored worker in the social sphere of Ukraine, the nominee of the Woman of the Year Award given by our organization, and an honored member of Women's Federation for World Peace Ukraine. How will the project proceed? The multidisciplinary team of specialists of the Kyiv Svetoshin Center for Social and Psychological Rehabilitation in the city of Boyka will go to rural areas of the Kyiv region to provide on-site psychological, medical, consulting, and humanitarian assistance to the above categories. The team will consist of a professional psychologist, doctor, social worker, lawyer, and others. This emergency team will go one or two times a week to different villages and deliver to those in need. Ein Notfallteam, das in die ländlichen Gegenden geht. So, 
people in remote, I have to say that people in remote villages and what conditions, uh, they not only have difficulty accessing information and medical care, but also lack of basic things like food, clothes, and shoes. Therefore, a mandatory component of the project is the provision of humanitarian assistance and supplies necessities to at least 100 people. So what do we need in order to implement the project? As you can see, we need 15 euros for psychological consultation for each person and uh, 136 euros to form a humanitarian aid package for each person. The package will consist of food, medicine, clothes, footwear and blankets. And we also need about 6 1,194 euros for the project's operating expenses. The total amount of the project is 19,794 euros. Uh, I also want to point out that Women's Federation for World Peace Ukraine has had a huge experience in helping IDPs since 2014. And since the war's outbreak on February 24th, we have held dozens of various activities helping refugees and IDPs, providing assistance with medications, food and bedding for more than 100 internally displaced people and helping more than 50 Ukrainian families to evacuate abroad from places of hostilities. Many of these actions became possible thanks to our partners in Europe. So I just want to use this chance to thank the Women's Federation for World Peace of Europe, the Women's Federation of Belgium, France, and the United Kingdom for their donations and the various activities carried out by them on the field to support Ukraine. To conclude my presentation, I want to introduce their project coordinator from the Ukrainian side, Mrs. Lyudmila Grobovenko a Women's Federation Ukraine member, public figure, and the owner of a private collection of Ukrainian scarf and towels as the symbol of mother's love. So we will be really grateful for your support and we are open to cooperation. Thank you for your attention. And in the end, this is their PayPal information as well as bank information to send the donations. Yeah, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Anna, for yeah, for your appeal. Yeah, we will definitely support this uh, program. And um, just want to recognize these nations that have opened their doors to allow, you know, displaced people and refugees who have fled from war, like Poland and uh, Moldova. I know our chapter in Moldova has worked tirelessly to um, supply foods and also to uh, give shelter and accommodation for refugees who have fled this uh, terrible situation in the Ukraine. But I'd just like to add my own experience when I visited the Ukraine in uh, 2018 uh, with some no number of our colleagues from France and also Portugal and Netherlands. Um, we, we were invited by yourself to visit the rehabilitation center that you mentioned in your PowerPoint. It was quite traumatizing, not traumatizing, but it was quite a, um, effect, affected my, me a lot actually when you, you kind of showed us around to these different rooms. There was a room for children, you know, rehabilitation center for a room for children with toys and um, therapists there. And then also we had a round table discussion where we could meet mothers who came, um, who had been through this uh, difficult situation of the conflict. And uh, I just remember one woman there and that um, when I saw her face and when she tried to speak, she could hardly talk actually about, about, about her experiences that she had been through um, by, by losing her children, her, her, everything that she cherished, her children and her husband. And you could see the, the pain etched in her face and also the fear that was embedded in her. And this, uh, this center is so essential so needed actually and uh, I can never forget this woman's face but also at the same time there was a meeting that you organized in the parliament the Ukraine parliament where you invited us and there was women from a war that was happened in Bosnia and it was the same kind of pain these women were sharing you know it was like it so deep and uh, coming out of a, a place that you can't imagine that a, a woman would have to go and so I, I was just so uh, moved actually and I really want to we really want to here in Europe advocate and this program this humanitarian program and also at the same time we would like to seek for partners to work with us 
the more the more we can hold hands together and really um, help our people. It's so important. Yeah, thank you so much for and also being staying in the Ukraine during this continuously difficult time during the conflict and uh, just the other day we were having a, a, a team meeting and um, Anna was in in um, you know just could see her face because it was like the lights had gone off there was no power and just you, you you just feel so grateful for what you have but there are so many people who suffer in so many ways so thank you so much Anna and your team yeah, um, so please, at the end, we will put um, the slide with all the donation uh, details. So please go ahead and out of your heart to give something. So um, as, as we are um, coming to the conclusion of this uh, wonderful webinar, I would like to say a few thank yous to our wonderful speakers, especially to our, um, to Mrs. Caroline Hanchin and also Dr. J Pres President Julia Moon for spearheading this conference actually it's been incredible beyond what we imagined and to have such wonderful panelists and also um, our first ladies who gave such uh, incredible contributions at this time and all the dignitaries who who really um, offered so many insights that perhaps we didn't know and especially taking these high offices and breaking many barriers you know that uh, perhaps we don't see but you know enduring and going through a lot actually so we're very grateful for that and I did feel there was a silver lining through the whole of this program that education is very important uh, for our own um, um, for our, our youth for the future but also for ourselves to elevate ourselves as women and that we can take a greater role and greater opportunity as you, as you know, uh, our queen has passed here because I'm based in the UK. And the one point that she said that women, uh, at least herself, she said she has to be visible that people know that she's there. And I felt very much echoing what she feels, you know, that women have to be visible that they are there and they have something to contribute. And I felt all the contribution that everybody gave was so meaningful and nothing is ever lost, even if no one sees it it's never lost, it's always, it always contributes to the greater. So on that point, I would like to thank everybody and also our organizing team and our key partners, uh, the International Association for First Ladies and also uh, Rena Mawad Foundation. Can we take a picture? And also, um, yeah, please go ahead. I just continue to finish my, um, and also to, for our supporting organization, the UN Women, and uh, the UN NGO CSW or Geneva, and also Sharop Cities International. It's been a wonderful uh, conference, and yeah, we will take a photo now. And and also just a huge thank you to the, all the participants in the audience, even though we can't see you, but we know you're there, and and we appreciate your your uh, spending time with us. And I hope that uh, you could gain a lot from this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think at one point we had almost 300 on our on the Zoom call and most stayed. I mean, not so many dropped out. But besides that, we were live streaming in how many, how many different? Uh, Good. Uh, Lily, do you know? Can you say something mm. about that? it? went to Facebook Women's Federation, also to FFWP, UPF, and I believe it was planned to go to Albania Facebook as well uh -huh. in Albanian. So we will a report will be, will be made of this, and we will post it on our website. So I think you can you can go back to that. Also, the recording of this will need a little bit of editing, but we will post that after for you. So from my side too, just to say thank you so mm -hmm. much for everyone. It was an incredible effort, and so much behind behind the scenes hard work. Thank you to the interpreters. Also, thank you very much. Please turn your Cameras on if you can, if you, and, and we can take a screenshot. Okay. So one, two, three. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Thank you Sunita. Yes. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. To everyone. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. This is the details, don't forget. <laughs> Which we will also put on our 
our website, huh? Yeah, yeah. So you can find it. Okay, thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Yeah, thanks for staying so long. <laughs> it was long, but... <laughs>